all mixed at about the same values or the same lightness. And what I'm doing is painting different um, pathways of these colors, these big sweeping curves that come from the outside in towards the sun. Um, and starting with the kind of darker, cooler colors of the outside of the painting, um, and those curves get kind of narrower and narrower as we get in towards the sun. And then doing the opposite, coming away from the sun, painting with the lightest, warmest colors out towards um, those cooler um, areas. And what that does is provides like an overall gradation. As, as you move in closer to the sun, everything gets lighter and warmer. Uh, and that just really, really helps the glow. All of these various um, big curves of different colors, again, they just encourage your eye to move. Good morning and welcome, welcome back. Uh, this is episode 18 and becoming a successful artist with me, Tim Packer. And we're coming to you live today via Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the value of art and how people actually go about establishing the value of a particular piece of art and what makes one piece more valuable than another. And it's actually, it can get pretty complicated. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, if it's your first time here, I'm Tim Packer. I'm a fairly successful artist. I've had a very, very good career. And I've decided that what I want to do with my life now really is focus my attention on helping other artists achieve the dream to live the same kind of life that, that I've done. So we're coming to you live, but this is also available as a replay. So for those of you who are watching the replay, welcome. I won't be able to answer your comments though. But um, yeah, let's get going. Okay, so before we get, get going, um, if you want to let me know uh, where you're watching from. Hi, Sherry from Niagara Falls, back again. Uh, Greg from Williamsport, Maryland, welcome. And Gail from uh, Manitoba. Hi, Gail. A little earlier out there. I guess it's probably pretty cold out there right now. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk today about how how art gets valued. Like what determines why is one art, one painting sells for two hundred dollars and another one sells for two hundred thousand dollars? And there's a lot of things that go into that. And it, it basically just comes down to like the basic law of economics is supply and demand. When the demand outstrips the supply, then the price goes up. And if the price goes up and the demand still outstrips the supply, then it goes up again, 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 again. And it can go up kind of infinitesimally. Um, and that's what's happened to me over my career uh, initially. Hi, Maddie from Whitby, right, right around the corner from me. I'm in Whitby as well. Um, but when I started out, my works that, you know, would sell for two or three hundred dollars. Those same pieces now, same size pieces sell for three or four thousand dollars. And that's how generally as a working artist, your income goes up because you can only produce so many paintings in a year. And ideally what you want to have happen is develop a following, have the demand for your work continually go up so that you can keep increasing your prices until you reach the point where you can make a very good living off of your paintings. But before we get into how you do that, let's get into a little bit of the psychology of the typical art buyer out there, because there's a number of reasons why people buy artwork. And the lowest one is they just buy it to fill a wall, right? They want something to go with the couch. And this is if you were to go to an art festival um, with, you know, 30, 50, 100 artists there, the majority of the buyers are kind of in that mode. They're just looking for something nice that they can put over their couch or to put in their dining room. And that is the lowest level. That is not where you want to be because people that are buying at that level, all what they're looking for is something that's good enough, that's moderately appealing, but then they're going to go for the cheapest price. And, and at that stage, that is actually where most struggling artists are. They're fighting for that audience. But the problem is that the only way you can stand out from other artists who are producing similar work is to lower your price. Uh, and that becomes a race to the bottom um, that not only 
God forbid you win it or even worse, come second, right? Ideally, what you want to do is get to a point where it becomes more and more demand for your work and the price goes up and up and up. So beyond that kind of just lowest common denominator of just wanting something to go on the wall, um, why do people buy work? Well, the next one is they love an actual painting, right? They see the painting and the painting just reaches out to them. It grabs them. They love it. They don't just want a painting. They want that painting. So if you can create work that does that, then that work will sell really quickly. But the other problem that I see a lot of artists having is every once in a while they create a piece like that and then it sells really quickly. But the rest of their work doesn't do that. And so the rest of the work just sits there. And what you need to be able to do is consistently create work that does that. And then what happens is you develop a following where people love the artist and they love the artist's work and they love pretty much all of the artist's work. And when you reach that level, then people will buy a piece just because it's by you or by any other artist. Now, as long as you have also kind of been very religious about, you know, there's a minimum bar of quality of work that goes out there and everything is above that bar. Once you've achieved that kind of following, then you shouldn't have any trouble selling your work. And as you get more and more exposure, your the demand will go up and your prices will go up. So that's kind of, that's the route that I have taken. And that's the route actually that I think most working artists out there that are selling their work take. Um, but it can become very confusing for aspiring artists when they look at other work and some work is really expensive and try to figure out, well, why is that? And that's because there's a couple other reasons why people buy work. And one of them is because someone else told them that that artist was really good and that they should buy that artist's work. Now, in that situation, it really doesn't matter what the actual piece of art looks like. It only, it only matters that someone who that person trusts has said, this artist is, is really good and you should buy their work. And that's where we get into things like art critics. When we get into people who are, who are gallery owners or directors at, at like very big, especially when you get into the avant-garde um, art galleries, the, the person that's buying the art, they don't, they don't even really care about the art. They don't even look at the art. They just rely on the other person's opinion to tell them about where they should spend their money and what art they should buy. And then we get to the highest level where people are buying art as an investment, right? So when you look at the, you know, when one of Van Gogh's paintings sells for 20 million or $30 million, the person's not buying it because that is so much better than any other painting out there. They're buying it almost as a commodity that they know it is going to increase in value and they'll be able to sell it later on. Now, when we get into the motivations behind people buying art, the, the one where the artist, where the person falls in love with the work, they buy the work because of how it makes them feel, right? They look at the piece and it just, hi, Tracy, welcome to the show. Um, but they look at the work and, and it makes them feel a certain way. And that's what they are buying. They are buying the ability to take that piece of work home with them. And every day when they walk in the room and they see that work and it just reaches out, it engages them. That's the feeling that they want. That's why they're buying the work. Now, for the most part, when you get into the thing, when people are buying art because someone told them that this is who you should buy. So again, that could be could be an interior designer, could be a, an art critic who, who's, whose opinion they follow, could be a gallery owner. Often they're buying it, not because how the work makes them feel, but what, how they feel about what it says about them, right? So it's like, again, if, if you go and you spend a hundred thousand dollars on some up and coming artist, especially if if there's no real kind of just intrinsic merit in the work, they're doing that because it says something about them. It says that they're the type of person, first of all, who can afford a hundred thousand dollars or a half million dollars for a painting, and it says that they're on the cutting edge. That you know most people wouldn't understand why this work is so valuable, but I do, and and that makes them feel good, right? That's the same reason someone will spend a thousand dollars for a purse. It's not so much that that purse is worth a thousand dollars. It's what it says about them when they walk down the street carrying that purse. 
So those are the kind of two different motivations of the buyers. Um, and when we get into, into the whole art thing, I'm just going to talk about a few examples of where it, it is all just about what someone said and who they told. So we look at Jackson Pollock, right? He, in the 1950s, was a struggling artist, you know, couldn't get, couldn't get covered in any galleries, couldn't sell any work. And he came to the attention of Clement Greenberg, who was a very, very influential art critic that wrote in a lot of the top newspapers and had a lot of influence. Well, at the time, there were a number of German and European artists who were like at the cutting edge of abstract expressionism. And there was no one really in the United States that that was kind of mentioned in the same circles as them. And this became very much kind of like a national nationalistic kind of thing that the Americans wanted to have an artist that, that we could say was that he's in the same same ballpark as these other European artists. And Clement Greenberg picked Jackson Pollock and he could have picked anybody, but he picked Jackson Pollock. And then he came out in a very famous article and he said that Jackson Pollock was the greatest American artist of the 20th century. And when he said that, all of a sudden, Jackson Pollock's value went way, way, way up. His work started being pub being purchased by some of the richest families in New York. And all of a sudden, his work was being shown in, in very, very high-end galleries. If you go into the Metropolitan Museum of Art now, you'll see a huge Jackson Pollock in there. But Jackson Pollock was Jackson Pollock, not because there was anything specific about his work that all kinds of people went, oh my God, I love it. It was because one person just picked him and said, he's the one. Now that also happened to a kind of much smaller degree um, in New York, and it's probably still going on. Um, and that would be the idea where uh, an influential owner in a gallery would just pick an artist and say, okay, this is, this is the next one. And, and what they would often do is they would host a show of the artist's work but what they would do is they'd go to the artist and say, okay, I'm going to buy all of the works off of you before the show even opens. And they might spend, they might pay three, four, five, six hundred dollars a piece, say for the 15 or 20 paintings. Well, then they would host this huge opening. And when all the clientele came, all the pieces would already be marked for set, marked sold. Now, the gallery owner wouldn't tell people that he bought them. But what people would be led to believe was that, oh, my God, this artist is so popular that all the works have sold before the artist has even exhibited them, that they all went in pre-sales to, to very high-end clients. And then what would happen is the next show that the artist did, the, the gallery owner would pump, pump up the artist's kind of value and say, yeah, you know, last time he sold out before the show even opened. And then the prices of the pieces might be $5,000 a piece or $10,000 a piece. And of course, these people are, are buying because they believe that this person has, has steered them in the right direction. And, and they would come and the works would sell. And then this would just keep going on. And it, it became, it's what's called in the stock market, a pump and dump. Um, and I actually had had experience with that when I was in the fraud squad, where basically what happened is is certain kind of fraudulent and um, deceitful brokers will will call just cold call tons and tons and tons of client lists, pumping up one stock, telling people you got to buy this stock. It's about to pop. It's about to pop. And if enough people buy the stock, then the value goes up and up and up. And then what happens is the brokers who actually bought a bunch before they did the pump and dump, they sell and the stock price plummets. And that actually happened. I remember watching a documentary uh, a few years ago, and it was about this artist who back in the 80s was one of these artists who got picked, right? This certain influential gallery in New York kind of picked him, kind of did this whole system with him. And he was to the point where he was getting twenty and $30,000 a painting. And this artist made a ton of money. Uh, but then what ended up happening is he got into drugs, he got into booze and kind of just totally quit producing art and kind of fell off the radar. Well, this documentary is art used to launder money. Also, probably because anything that anything where you can have something that's very, very small and portable that has a huge amount of value, that's very attractive, right, for people who are trying to launder money. But again, not my expertise, and I'm not going to get into that. But what's important is what happened to this artist. So this artist, after, uh, hi, Constantinos, welcome again from Athens. Um, but what this artist 
So the artist now cleaned himself up. He'd been away from the art game for 10 years. He was in a position where his works were selling for $25,000, $30,000, and he was selling a lot. Uh, and he cleaned himself up, and now he was going to try and get back into painting again. And this artist's work, I mean, at best you could say it was a cheap knockoff of Peter Max sort of stuff. It, it was, was, in my opinion, not very good, didn't show a lot of skill. It was very kitschy. Um, but he was coming back to mount his comeback. And actually, he had he had arranged to have a film crew was going to cover this, uh, his comeback. And they showed him. He was calling the gallery owner that used to sell his work for twenty-five dollars and $30,000 a piece and actually had had spent twenty or 30000 on a few himself. He was calling all of his old collectors, people who he knew who had actually spent twenty-five or $30,000 on his work. And what he was going to do was put this his first painting up on eBay and see what happened. So he did this and the painting sold for $200 because that's all the art was worth. And when he didn't have that whole machine behind him of people telling other people, oh, this guy's work is really valuable. It's a really good investment, all this kind of stuff. The actual value, intrinsic value of it as a piece of art was not very much at all. And 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 again, the reason I know that is that, you know, any other any artist who had gone the other route where they've developed a huge following. And for whatever reason, their work goes off market for a while. It's not available. When they come back and pieces become available, say an artist dies, for instance, and now for the first time in five years, a piece is available. It's going to sell for a lot more than what it was selling for when the artist was alive and producing. And so, again, that's that whole idea of someone saying that people should buy your work. And if you want to succeed there, again, the only thing you can do is get picked. Um, and how do you get picked? I mean, that I don't know, right? There's hundreds of thousands of artists out there clamoring to the people that have this kind of power to say, pick me, pick me. Um, but unless you get picked, it's not going to happen. And even if it gets, even if you get picked, it only works for as long as they still keep picking you and keep pushing you. And they'll only do that as long as you're making them money. Again, that artist committed the, the cardinal sin of he quit producing work. That gallery owner could no longer make money off him. So he just moved on and picked somebody else. Now, there's another reason why an artist's work might be very valuable, and that's if they're a celebrity, right? So I think I've talked about this before, but it's like Tony Bennett is a, is a painter, the, the singer, and he's actually... Pretty good. Like his stuff's okay. But I mean, I think Tony Bennett's work, if it was just at an art festival, you know, it might sell for a few hundred dollars. It might sell for a thousand dollars, but his work goes for like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars And it's not because the art is very good. It's because the art is by Tony Bennett. And the same thing, you, you can, there are a lot of actual musicians who are in that boat because a lot of people who paint also play music or sing or whatever, they're involved in music. And so when you're looking at a piece of art, because the thing that we need to do as artists is just kind of like, oh yeah, I want to get my work to the point where it's selling in the, in the thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. And so the one way to do that is look at art that's selling in that, in that range but then you have to ask yourself, why is it selling in that range? If it's selling in that range because the person got picked, then the only thing you can do is get picked. If it's selling in that range because the person is a celebrity, then you need to become a celebrity. Um, and if it's selling in that range, Jim Carrey's a good example. Yeah, there's a ton of actors. I mean, I, I remember a, a Dick Van Dyke episode showing my age there where they bought some painting at an auction and it was an Artanis uh, and they didn't know who this artist was, but they thought there might be a painting underneath it. And so they actually stripped the painting off the top to find what was underneath. And it was just some hokey painting. Then they found out later that Artanis is actually how Frank Sinatra signed his name backwards. And if they had kept the Sinatra, it would have been worth a lot of money. But it wasn't because it was a great painting, right? It's because it was by Frank Sinatra. And that's where, where it's important for us as artists is when you're looking at art that's selling is you have to ask why. And for our village, again, if you want to create a good living from 
from painting work that you love, where enough people love your work, where you're going to develop a following, where the demand is going to continually increase. And eventually there's going to be so much demand that your works are going to sell in the thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. You need to make sure that you're looking at other artists who are in that same village. And then when you look at their paintings, then you can say, okay, what is it about this particular painting that maybe I could learn something from? Because you can't learn anything from Tony Bennett's work. You can't learn anything from Jackson Pollock's work about what it takes to make a painting that people are willing to spend a lot of money on. And so the question also then becomes, well, how do you tell the difference when you're looking at a piece of art? How do you know? Is it because, and, and it's say it's selling for $10,000, right? That's a, $10,000 is, 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 is kind of a good benchmark. When you get to the point where you're selling a piece of art for $10,000, you are making a good living as an artist. And I think that's where most people want to get to. And Scott Burdick, who's a, a brilliant American artist, if you don't know Scott Burdick, I'm going to be doing some episodes down the road where I'm going to expose you to some of my favorite artists, both those I know and those who I don't know, but who, who, who I'm huge fans of. He, he, he's done a YouTube video that all about, it's called the banishment of beauty, which I certainly recommend you watch. And it's where it became that art not only didn't need to be beautiful, but art should be ugly. Um, which, and there's, that's the whole thing that gets into the postmodernism stuff I talked about yesterday, but he's come up with a great benchmark and he calls it the dumpster test. And he says, like, if you want to know which, if, if you want to know, is this art valuable because someone said it was, or, or just because it's an investment that, that, you know, but the art itself really isn't, isn't any good. He's, he's come up with the dumpster test, which is if an average person who had a moderate interest in art, saw that piece of art lying in a dumpster, had no idea who the artist was and had no idea the value of it, would it appeal to them enough that they would climb down into the dumpster and retrieve the work because they would love to hang it on their wall at home? And if you ask that question about any particular piece of art, ask it of yourself. If you didn't know who did it, and you didn't know the value, would you climb into a dumpster and get it just because the piece is appealing enough, even for free, that you would like to hang it on your wall? And if it's not, then it's not something you need to be concerned about in terms of, can I learn something from this painting to succeed in our village? Because it's not. If you wouldn't climb into a dumpster just to hang it on your wall, then that's not the type of work someone is going to pay five hundred, a thousand, or ten thousand dollars for at a gallery or at an art festival. So, again, that dumpster test, I just, I just kind of love, love that, um, and it just makes everything so simple when you, when you just look at art in that way. Um, and again, um, with regard to what I talked about yesterday, we only be, need to be concerned about our village, and in our village. There are certain things that that people love, right? And again, you don't need to create work that everyone loves, but you need to create work that enough people love. First of all, you need to create work and get exposure so that if however many paintings you create in a year, you have a bigger audience than that of people who are willing to buy your work. Because if that happens, then what, what will happen is your work will sell quickly so you can keep raising the prices. So you don't need to have everyone love your work. I don't need to sell 10,000 paintings in a year. I can't produce 10,000 paintings in a year. At the time when I, was, when I was showing in a ton of galleries, I would produce 100 paintings a year. I only needed to have a couple hundred people who were willing to pay my current prices to continue to drive my prices up and up and up. Um, and then as you get higher and higher prices, what happens is your audience also gets smaller because fewer and fewer people actually have the wherewithal to actually buy your work. But in our village, again, you can do things to, to make sure your work is getting better. So if you're not going to try to get picked by somebody, you're not going to become a celebrity. What can you do? Well, this gets back to kind of the traditional art model that's been part of civilization right up until the emergence of postmodernism. You can improve your skills, right? You can, you can improve your drawing ability. You can improve your brushwork. You can learn more skills. You can learn different approaches to painting. 
you can improve your compositional sense. And that's actually for most artists, I think that's the biggest thing I see out there is composition is just the way in which we arrange the shapes, values, edges, colors, etc. cetera. Um, and if you can do that, you only have to do a half decent job of actually executing the painting to make it a success. And if you really want to see composition that's that's great, look at abstract paintings. And there's an awful lot of bad abstract paintings out there because the worst thing that, that I see happening out there is people can't draw, they don't have any skills, so they go, well, I'll just paint abstract. And every once in a while, even like Coco the monkey arranges stuff in a way that's very pleasing to the eye. But what you want to look for is look for abstract artists where they consistently create work, where it's not about anything, but their work reaches out and grabs you. It draws you in. It just, you, you stand in front of it for hours. Like for me, Brian Rutenberg is one of those artists. He's actually probably my favorite living artist because I recognize how hard it is to create an abstract painting that actually does that when you're not hanging on drawing ability or potentially a the, the person's affinity for the subject matter or a sentimental appeal for the for whatever it is it's just colors values edges shapes and artists that can do that and still have that oh my god i love that piece those are people who you want to study in terms of okay what are they doing here to actually create that kind of engagement with the audience. Um, and so again, composition. And then the final thing you can do is you can explore your creativity. Creativity is a skill. Uh, it's like a muscle that can be exercised and can be worked. And the way that we do that is by moving into what's called process mode. And in process mode, that's where you go and you try things that you don't know how to do. Uh, so initially, one of the best ways to move into process mode is to follow other artists' processes. For example, for me, when I first started painting portraits, I had no idea what to do. I went out and bought a couple of books that showed different techniques of painting portraits. Uh, and then I followed those techniques several times with each different artist's um, process. And then gradually I started incorporating a little bit from this artist, a little bit from this artist. And then you start playing, well, what if, what if I do something like this, or that this other artist does that has nothing to do with portraits? What if I inject that into my, into my process? And over time, as you continually improve your skills and you continually improve your sense of composition, you'll reach a point where pretty much everything that you do is actually a good painting with a good composition and and will sell. And that's actually where Brooke is right now. Uh, Brooke Cormier, I'm sure most of you know who she is. If you look at her work, there's really no, no continuity from one painting to the next in terms of can you identify a particular style or something about it. But they all are masterfully composed. They all show mastery of skill. Um, and she's in that process mode. They all turn out better than most artists work so that she's still continually selling her work. And she's become kind of famous, right? She's got a, an Instagram following of close to a quarter million people. So she's capitalizing on that as well. And when I was in that stage of process mode for about three years, my work was all over the map stylistically, but I was still selling it all because it, it, I, because I developed the skills, I developed the compositional sense. Everything that I did actually turned out more appealing than most of the artists that were at the festivals that I did. And then once I, um, once I finally, I want to say found my voice, but it's not actually like that. It's like if you spend time doing that and going back and forth between the three modes of painting, eventually your voice finds you where it just kind of all of a sudden you just find that this is what you're doing. You've just kind of been led into that. Once my voice found me, then what happened is I started, I started very quickly building a following of people who wanted my work, uh, where initially Literally, I would deliver paintings to a gallery. And as I was walking stuff into the gallery from the parking lot, people would be there waiting because the gallery owner told them I was bringing work. And they'd be saying, I want that one. Someone else would be saying, I want that one. And the works would sell before I even got to the door. Um, and that's ideally what you want. Once you get to that stage, it's very, very easy to make a good living as an artist. The only question then is how much you want to scale that. 
right? That's where things like doing prints, being in more galleries, it's all kinds of things you can do to scale the earnings. Um, but the, the first thing you want to do is to get your art to that stage. Um, and that's, that's how and why people value art. So I hope hope that has been helpful. Again, the reason this is important is, again, you want to be comparing apples and apples. Um, oh, I just want to talk one more thing about, uh, about that whole because someone said so thing. There was a Jackson Pollock, um, there's a documentary uh, by some woman. Uh, it's about some woman who she thinks she's got a Jackson Pollock. She bought it in a garage sale. Um, but people have looked at it and actually think it actually might be by Jackson Pollock. Pollock, or it might not be. And in this documentary, I mean, they've done forensic tests on the paint, compared it to the paint in the floor, Pollock studio, and it all looks like it might in fact be a Pollock. And I, I don't know what, what the, because at the end of the show, they still hadn't reached a determination. They were going to be doing DNA testing on, on, on like a sweat that was on the back of the canvas or whatever. But the thing about this was they said, if it's a Jackson Pollock, it's worth millions of dollars. If it's not a Jackson Pollock, it's worthless. Like not worth a thousand or two thousand or three thousand. If it's not a Jackson Pollock, it's like you wouldn't even be able to sell it at a garage sale. And again, that gets into that whole thing of so it'd be no use for you to compare yourself against that piece and say, oh, I should do work like that, because that's only valuable if it was done by Jackson Pollock, um, and because he got picked. Clement Greenberg said. He's the greatest painter in America and enough people believed him, enough people with a lot of money that the price of Jackson Pollock's just went through the roof. You're str struggling with your finding your style. You've tried so many things. I hear you. Um, and Tracy, just so you know, I spent three years painting every day in a different process mode. I created literally 400 paintings all of them di different subject matter different stylistic approaches different mediums uh and and eventually i found my style and there's no guarantee it's going to happen there so i would ask you have you painted 300 separate paintings all of them experimenting with style all of them experimenting with subject matter experimenting with 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 various approaches what i often hear from people is it's like no i i've done 10 different paintings uh, and i still can't come up with it and if you're doing that every day, I would also say to you, are you working on your skills, right? So again, I don't know what your skill set is, but it's like, have you mastered drawing? And I mean, mastered drawing, not pretty good, because until you've mastered drawing, I believe every artist should keep a sketchbook and should draw for 20 minutes a day, every day to improve that skill. Have you mastered composition? Because if you haven't mastered composition, you just could be, you just could be painting poor compositions in many, many different stylistic approaches. And a poor composition is not going to sell. Uh, a, a strong composition that, that brings the viewer in and engages them, as I said, even if it's only done reasonably competently, will sell. So there's no point searching for your voice until you've mastered all the skills and until you've mastered composition. Because then even if you create one of those pieces where people go, oh my God, I love it, it might have just been a fluke, right? Um, because what you want to do is create a hundred different paintings, all that are masterfully composed, all that are masterfully executed, and then you know people are reacting based on the stylistic approach. But if your composition is up and down like a toilet seat, if your technical skills that are evident in the painting are up and down like a toilet seat, then they might pick that particular painting just because that happened to be the best composition you lucked into. It might have nothing to do with the stylistic approach. So the only way you can measure style or voice is when you know that they're all at the same level compositionally. They're all masterfully composed. They're all masterfully executed. And then the only variable is the stylistic approach or the subject matter or the medium that you're doing. And then the other thing that you need to do is, you're welcome, Gail. Um, the other thing that you need to do is also judge how much you love the process, right? Because you could find yourself in a situation where you're, you're producing work, where people love it, um, and it's like you've, ma you've masterfully composed, masterfully executed, everybody loves it, and it was something that you just tried and it worked, but you might say, I don't really like painting that way, and I certainly don't want to paint that way every day for the rest of my life, because that's the other thing is once 
once you find that voice or the voice finds you that people love, you are going to be doing that a lot. Um, and you need to love the process. So it's not just about what other people think about your work. It's finding that confluence where you love the work, you love the process, and enough of the public loves the process. And then it's just a matter of getting more exposure. And, and what, again, like I said, once you hit that stage, um, that's kind of the tipping point when most artists earn about $30,000 a year. And that's why the focus on my uh, uh, course of earning a decent living as a successful artist is getting to the point where you're earning 30 grand a year. Because once you're earning 30 grand a year, you're up in like the top, I don't know, 97th, 98th percentile of working artists. Then your income will triple just because of the fact that your audience will grow and the the price of your, your work will grow. Um, but yeah, I also want to talk about also these whole daily shows. So initially when I, when I started, um, and I'm going to talk next week about setting plans for the new year. I actually, I typically set my plans for the new year prior to the new year or after the new year. I find right at new year is a really bad time to set new year's resolutions because you're, there's so much going on. There's a lot of partying and stuff like that. Plus you're, you're feeling kind of hung over from, uh, from new year's. That's not a good day to say I'm going to the gym or whatever. And so for this year, I really wanted to dig deep on live the live broadcast to grow my audience and also to grow exposure for um, for my online art academy. And I thought, well, I'm going to try and do a live show every day. Now, I initially thought I'm going to do five minutes live on YouTube every day. Uh, and I very quickly realized that there's nothing I can say in five minutes. Uh, it's, it, it's difficult for me. What are we at now? We're at 36 uh, minutes. And I actually, I think this long form content is really, really good. And this is where I excel. But I also realize that I'm, I'm coming up on uh, Friday will be four weeks in a row of going live every day, Monday to Friday. I realize that you know, like it's not reasonable for me to expect to produce a half an hour to an hour of live content five days a week. Um, I, I know I would be a basket case um, by doing that. So I'm actually going to be cutting back on, I'm going to finish off this week. I'm going to, because I want to do a whole month of every day, Monday to Friday. But as of next week, I'm going to be cutting back, I think, to one day a week. And I think it's going to be Wednesday. I'll confirm that. Now, I knew this was going to be happening anyways, because my wife and I were supposed to be going down to Florida for two weeks and then Hilton Head for two weeks, uh, starting January 15th. Of course, that was up in the air because of the whole COVID. But it looks like now we're probably going to be able to go. So I knew that there was no way I was going to be able to keep doing it into, into February. Um, but I just decided that, yeah, this is as much as I'm enjoying it, it's uh, it's the last month has gone by like in a blink. And, uh, you know, I go to I go I finish the show and I spend time thinking about what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. And I go to bed thinking about it. I'm dreaming about it. And I get up in the morning and then I, I prepare for it, do my notes and then and then go on and do it, um, which is great. But it means there's not a lot of time for other things. So I'm going to be backing off to once a day, at least for the next six six weeks after after this week and i think it's going to be wednesday at noon it is going to be wednesday at noon i'll just say that it's going to be wednesday at noon um, and providing i have good wi-fi when i'm uh down in florida and at hilton head i'll be doing it from there and then when i get back in the middle of february i'll reassess and i might decide to do two days a week um, because one of the things that i plan on doing going forward is i plan on having a number of guests that i interview where Basically, I want to be interviewing a number of other successful artists to get their take. So you're not just getting um, my my opinions on on what it takes uh, to become successful or or anything like that. So tomorrow, the next two days are actually going to be easy days and they're going to be fun days. Tomorrow, I'm going to introduce you to several artists whose work I love, who are also good friends of mine. And I'm going to tell you stories about how I met them um, and how I came to know them. And then on Friday, I'm going to introduce you to the work of some artists who I don't know, but who I am huge, huge fans of. And that is also, I think, going to be part of the uh, the ongoing process of shows of doing that to show you if you are going to look at an artist's work and, and see about, gee, what can I learn from that? Well, I'm going to give you suggestions of artists that I think you can learn an awful lot from. Do we have any questions or anything there, Cameron, that I need to deal with? Or? Yeah. Let's see. 
let's see. Well, again, it depends, Constantinos, and what village you're in. Um, that uniqueness, if, if it's if it's in the realm of kind of like, again, because someone picks you, then maybe. Uh, but if if you want to be in that thing where you go out and I'm and again, I'm my background is coming from doing art festivals, being of the 30 or 100 artists that are a festival that are at the festival, being one of the top artists in terms of sales. And I can tell you there that being unique on its own is people people. Some people go for that, but not many, um, because the work could just be uniquely bad. Uh, I think the key is, and, and and then the whole thing is, well, picking, how can you be unique that's somehow going to reach out and engage people? And again, you're, you're determining for someone to pick your uniqueness um, to say that, wow, this is amazing. Whereas if you have the skill and you have the the knowledge of composition, then you go for uniqueness. That is the, that's the only sure way I know to get there. Every other way, if you're just going to say, well, I don't want to learn to draw. I don't want to learn composition. I'm just going to, you know, express myself on the canvas. Well, yeah, go ahead and good luck. And there is a chance you might get picked. But there's also a chance 40 years from now, you're still producing work that's poorly composed, that's poorly executed, that's unique in the sense that only, oh, yeah, there's that artist that's here every year that never sells anything. Um, and you don't want to be that guy. Right. And what I'm talking about is the, it's just like if you want to be a doctor. Right. There is a path to being a doctor. It's not easy. Um, and someone may say, well, I don't like chemistry and I don't want to have to take chemistry. And the, but the response is, well, you have to take chemistry if you want to become a doctor and you have to pass chemistry. Uh, and it's like, well, I don't want to do that. And it's like, well, then you should probably find another career, right? Um, and there's no way to become a doctor without passing chemistry. You can become famous and rich as an artist without mastering drawing and without mastering composition and without spending time in process mode. But then it's like winning the lottery. It's like, yeah, one in every hundred thousand artists who fits that bill ends up getting picked and ends up becoming famous and ends up earning a good living. But I would just say to all of you is look up some of the top galleries that are out there. And in particular, galleries that sell work where um, it's it's selling to that audience that I talk about work where people appreciate mastery of skill, appreciate mastery of composition, and appreciate kind of that unique voice. And look at the top selling artists in those galleries. They all have mastered drawing. They've mastered the technical skills. They have masteries of composition, and they've carved out a unique voice. That is the secret. There's no, uh, otherwise, again, you're just playing a scratch and win and hoping to get picked. And there are millions of artists out there hoping to get picked. That's that's not a very effective strategy, I don't think, to get where you want to be in five or 10 years. Or I guarantee you, if you spend the next year, two, three, four, five years mastering the skills, mastering composition, spending time in process mode, you will get there. Um, is it, it might take a year, it might take three years, it might take five years, but you're going to get there. Anything else is just a crapshoot. You're playing scratch and wins, and you might be 20 years from now still thinking, oh, why is nobody buying my work? So I think that's probably a good note to end it on. So thanks for joining me. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll introduce you to some of my buddies who are brilliant painters.